You are now live. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this discussion of force majeure contract clauses and insurance issues arising from contract disruptions during the pandemic. I'm Andrea Terry, the Director of Learning for the Maryland State Bar Association, and I'd like to thank the MSBA Business Law Section for coordinating this program and bringing together our team of presenters today. Our faculty includes Sweta Gandhi with Saul Ewing, Roy Niedermeyer with Paley Rothman, Alexander Kretikos with Miles and Stockbridge, and Joseph Beavers also with Miles and Stockbridge. We're grateful for the time and effort they've put into today's session. If you have questions during the presentation, please email them to chriselle at msba.org, the email address that you see at the bottom of your screen. Our faculty will do their best to answer as many questions as they can. We've scheduled uh, this session to go to 1.30 to accommodate as many questions as possible. Um, so thank you again, all viewers for joining us and thank you to our team of presenters. And I'll turn the program over now to Roy Niedermeyer to begin. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, with the uh, COVID pandemic ongoing and with so many state, county and closure of essential businesses, along with these stay at home and gathering restrictions, many businesses and individuals have been suffering financial losses, but have continuing obligations of payment and performance under their contracts. So they've been looking for relief from um, their obligations and they have turned in that regard to force majeure provisions in contracts, the UCC and common law doctrines of impossibility and frustration. And Sweda and I are gonna discuss with you those three elements. So what is, to the next slide, what is a force majeure provision? Well, it's a contract provision that excuses performance or discharges or suspends a party's performance because of the happening of a certain event. Now, these are often boilerplate provisions in contracts and not too much attention has been paid to them uh, previously. They have a number of common elements. They usually list types or series of described events which are considered to be the force majeure events, or they may have a catch-all phrase such as uh, force majeure or events or occurrences beyond the control of a, of a party. They also um, involve the foreseeability of any of the particular events as an element of the force majeure clause. Some of them even may include notice requirements, mitigation obligations, or describe whether the performance is postponed, terminated, or suspended. But the key element here is that all of these are contract specific. They must be invoked from the contract itself. And the specific contract language is going to control the rights of the parties. So let's take a look at some sample force majeure provisions in our next slide. As you can see there, they range from some very simple uh, several sentences to many multiple sentences. If you notice, the first one is a simple boilerplate type of clause. It only has four lines. It describes some general uh, occurrences that constitute the force majeure. The other two that I've included, and Swayda and I have included here, is for a, a couple of reasons. First of all, you'll notice that the second one specifically mentions epidemics and has a much lengthier list of described events. This is going to be a lot of assistance to this party in, in trying to invoke and enforce that provision. In addition to which, you'll see that at the bottom of the clauses, there are non-discriminatory provisions, best efforts to mitigate, or provisions that require actual notice of the invocation of this particular clause uh, to the other party. So some of the 
force majeure clauses are very simple, like the first one. Some of them are more thorough, more complex. But again, it's the contract language of your particular clause that's going to contr control what rights you have and what obligations you may have be able to suspend or avoid. So now I think we can go to the next slide. And Sueda, would you please go into the Maryland law and the case law on this? Sure. So um, Roy, it's a great description overall of force majeure clauses. Um, the elements that are required um, by different states will differ. So what works in a force majeure clause for say Mar Maryland is not gonna necessarily work in a force majeure clause for Delaware. The, the Maryland courts have especially not provided a lot of guidance on how they will, uh, in, sorry, excuse me, in, interpret force majeure provisions. We know that they'll look at them narrowly, but we don't know how narrowly. So we know in other jurisdictions as I will go through on the next couple of slides, slides that certain jurisdictions will not accept a catch-all clause that, that Roy mentioned before, but will require some additional language in order to interpret the, the catch-all clause more broadly. In Maryland, we're not sure how the courts are gonna look at that. They may accept a catch-all clause without any variation, they may not. Um, it's just, it, it, there hasn't been any case law to give us any information on that. Um, but we do, you know, overall recommend that looking at other states case law may be helpful in determining what a best practice might be uh, until Maryland cases provide us with some guidance. Um, could you do the next slide? Could I just mention that um, while Maryland has no case law specifically interpreting a force majeure provision, there's some general principles that Maryland is strong on, which we'll come to later, but the key seems to be in the Maryland concepts of some sort of foreseeability of the event and the impossibility of performance. And, and this is also that, as I, we talked about the catch-all phrase, um, the catch-all phrase though is gonna be governed by the specifics of the contract under general contract law uh, interpretation. So if you have a catch-all and you have specific language, the courts are gonna look at the specific language to understand what you meant by the catch-all. Thanks, Roy. Um, the next slide we've gone to talk, looks at three different jurisdictions um, and looking at the current case law that's available uh, that talks about how courts have interpreted force majeure provisions in the past. So as you can see, uh, Maryland doesn't have much guidance on the events that would be connected to COVID-19. No case law on interpreting how they would look at a list of events no case law on whether what they would require in a catch-all language, um, no case law really on foreseeability and um, government actions. I think one of the things to be fully aware of here is that as Maryland courts are faced with this question, it may be that they look to other jurisdictions to see what Maryland law should look like um, post COVID-19. Now, while we can't tell what other jurisdictions will do with COVID-19, um, but what we do know is the current uh, look and feel of what those cases uh, and requirements are. So for example, in Delaware, um, they do um, narrowly construe the clause, but they will, will accept the catch-all language if it, it says something to the effect of any reason whatsoever. It seems that courts are really looking to see if the parties are using boilerplate and have not really considered the issue or actually have considered the issue and have contractually agreed to broaden the force majeure clause in a contract. Um, the foreseeability aspect in cases of force majeure has not really been well developed in Delaware either. And there really is no uh, indication of whether the courts in Delaware will consider government regulations or government orders to be considered force majeure if they're not in the list of events that are in the force majeure clause. New York actually has a great deal more uh, authority about force majeure provisions. They have also said that they will narrowly construe them, um, but they really are strict in looking at the list of events um, in terms of whether or not they will excuse performance under a contract. Um, it's not 
it, they combine what Roy had said earlier about wanting to make sure they're looking at the plain language of the contract and strictly complying with it. They simply just go a step further and say, like, if, if the event's not in there, then the parties must have agreed that it's not going to be part of the force measure provision. Um, they have, though, agreed that if the parties have, appears that the parties have considered other events, that, that you can take advantage of a catch-all phrase if you include language that's similar to any cause, whether similar or dissimilar to the foregoing. So there are ways in which to broaden the impact of the force majeure clause, but in New York, you must really use specific language to do so. It, New York also requires that the event not be foreseeable. So foreseeability really goes to the time at which the contract was made. So for contracts that are made, say, after April 1st, if you don't include pandemic or epidemic or government orders in your contract clause, it's likely that the courts will say that, you know, you knew that events like COVID-19 had happened and that you the decision not to include them in the list of events was purposeful. And so we're not going to consider them. And so um, but if you didn't have those phrases a year ago, it certainly you certainly could say that the, these events that we're currently facing are unforeseeable. Um, the courts will also in New York look to the industry standards of what is considered a force majeure uh, event. Um, again, not to fully broaden the clause, but to look and see if, you know, how certain of the phrases would be interpreted. Um, he, and again, in New York, uh, unlike the case law in other jurisdictions, you have to make an attempt to mitigate or attempt to perform in order to, to be able to take advantage of the force majeure clause. Um, Roy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, there's been a modern trend because foreseeability is a very broad concept and theoretically anything is foreseeable uh, as a matter of just possibility. But there's been a modern trend in the courts and there's a, a case out of the Fourth Circuit here that, that could be applied in Maryland that they're looking for what the parties contemplate as real possibilities. Uh, that would influence their contract, not some abstract event that might theoretically occur. So there, there are cases that says that it's also the degree of foreseeability. And as, as Swayda points out, now that we've had some epidemics, uh, you would be hard pressed to state that it wasn't foreseeable that we would have them in the future or they would, uh, they would occur. Okay, next slide. So uh, we often look at force majeure clauses, and many of them include the, um, that performance will be excused because it's an act of God, because of an act of God. Um, most jurisdictions, including the ones in New York and Delaware, um, have very strict also definition of what is an act of God. So for something to be considered an act of God, most states require that it be an event that is uh, a physical event, uh, based on supernatural causes. And in most, uh, in, frankly, in all of the jurisdictions I've looked at, which is all the jurisdictions in which we have offices, the force majeure event must be the sole event that causes the inability to perform. So if there is an intervening action, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of act of God as a um, force majeure event to help you uh, avoid performance under a contract. Looking at COVID-19 specifically, the defense doesn't appear to be something that's going to be effective in, uh, it, in order to invoke a, or a force majeure clause. Because in most cases, um, it's not the COVID-19 virus that is the uh, factor which is, uh, um, which is delaying or excusing performance. It's actually government orders and regulations that have made um, companies shut down and to go to work from home, which may make it more difficult to provide service or performance. But it is not the act of God itself that is causing the failure to or the inability to perform. So it doesn't seem to fit under any jurisdiction's definition of how they would use act of God, um, either interpreting it separately or even uh, interpreting it as part of a force majeure clause. Roy? That's great. Let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> okay. What about the defense of government orders or government regulations? So we know 
that in New York and Delaware, you will likely only be able to take advantage of the defense of government orders or regulations if it's included in the list of events in the force majeure clause. Um, if it's not in the list of events, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it in New York and in Delaware. Now, I will caution that everything we're talking about with respect to case law is pre-COVID. And certainly COVID has been an extraordinary event and it's un we can't certainly say what exactly the court will do after this type of event when they're faced with force majeure provisions. Um, I do think that courts will look at whether, you know, maybe look more about their ability to exercise uh, some level of reasonableness when looking at some of these events. But it's we're, we, we just don't know how they will react. We do, and we especially don't know how courts will react in Maryland since they haven't really provided guidance on what needs to be included in a force majeure provision event in order to be able to take advantage of it. Again, like we talked about previously, if you can consider that the, um, if you have the right catch-all clause in your force majeure clause, that it is possible that you will be protected um, from having to perform due to government regulations or orders. Again, you have to think though, is the government regulation or order making it impossible for me to perform or is it making it more difficult for me to perform? So for example, if you have a pharmaceutical business who may, makes most of their uh, sales because of face-to-face -face meetings with doctors or um, you know, meetings with doctor's offices and they can't go to the doctor's offices but can only perform um, over the internet, that is, you know, do work from home, the party's going to have to pro pro prove in a case that they actually, it was impossible for them to perform, not just that it was financially more difficult or economically more difficult. Economic hardships such as loss of sales is not going to be enough to win the day. Next slide. We've already discussed um, a, a bit about the foreseeability uh, aspect, and we've noted that even prior to COVID-19, there have been other epidemics such as Ebola or SARS, which lead to the uh, foreseeability of similar things uh, happening. Again, this is the key element in Maryland under uh, not a specific Maryland case or but a Fourth Circuit case interpreting uh, Maryland law where, again, it was the real possibility of something happening uh, uh, to, that the parties could realistically contemplate as affecting uh, their, their contract and as part of the assumptions uh, in the contract. A lot of these concepts deal with an assignment or assumption of risk. When you enter into a contract, who is taking the risk that an event would or would not occur and whether it was foreseeable or not. And so it's really the allocation of risk under the contract that when the parties entered into that contract that the courts are trying to discern when they apply the uh, elements of either a force majeure clause or some of the common law uh, doctrines. Um, again, mitigation or what your performance will have to be is more easily controlled and governed by the contract clause and may be stated. If it's not in the specific language of the contract, however, um, it may be implied that there is a duty to take reasonable actions in either to try and relieve yourself from the restrictions of the supervening event or possibly even to allocate among different customers or other parties uh, in some sort of equalization uh, a mode. That's, we'll come to that in a moment in the, the UCC. Um, the different definitions under the contract clauses or the principles involve both impracticability, which is really more like a UCC concept, impossibility, which has been the concept that in non-force majeure interpretive cases, the Maryland courts have applied, or non-profitability, which has been a factor in none of the cases that the failure or the inability to actually profit from the contract uh, has not been sufficient to invoke uh, either the, the 
force majeure type of event or under the other principles. There is a Maryland case on, on specifically addressing this. Um, I think we could go to the next slide, which is the UCC slide. I just right. want to go right. ahead. Sorry, one, um, we had one question about whether uh, we could speak to DC case law. I just wanted to mention that um, in our uh, resource group on, um, on our website, we do have a, a chart that looks at other cases from other jurisdictions, including DC. I'm happy to forward that to, to anyone who would like a copy of that, but you can also find it on our website. And DC is included. Okay. You can see under the UCC section that it's impracticability that is the standard, but it has to go to the basic assumption on which the contract uh, was made. Uh, there is the caveat that the UCC, of course, only applies to contracts for the sale of goods. So it's gonna have limited applicability in many types of commercial contracts, such as leases, service contracts, it's, it is not, has not been designed specifically, and if you read the notes and comments for those type of contracts. Again, it has to go to the basic assumption of the contract, uh, or government restrictive orders could be deemed to fall within the UCC. So the UCC provision is different than impossibility, frustration of the performance, or frustration of the venture itself. Uh, that it's increased costs, like when you talk about whether it's impractical because of increased costs, that has not been a factor that the courts have relied upon or used to for successful invocation of the uh, UCC provision. The UCC actually provides in the notes types of things which are making impractical. Uh, that, for instance, shortage of raw materials or supplies, wars, embargoes, local crop failures, shutdown of major sources of supply. They do note that increased wages, prices of raw materials or costs of construction are not considered to be factors which allow the invocation of this particular section of the UCC because it's a known risk in those industries that those things could happen. And so they're not covered by this UCC provision. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the our last two areas of common law doctrines, which are uh, invoked for defenses to performance. Yeah, so the first one uh, we wanted to talk about was common law doctrine of impossibility. Uh, I think that it's uh, attempted to be used far more frequently than for, uh, the next defense, which is frustration. Um, it's basically in some ways similar to the definitions that we use in, um, in force majeure clauses, but not, uh, not providing as much protection actually. So it's an unexpected intervening event occurs. The parties had assumed that the event would not occur. So that's basically, it's a basic assumption of the contract. The event makes performance impossible or impracticable. The event was not foreseeable um, and could be reasonably expected to, or could not, and could not be reasonably expected to affect performance. Um, the doctrine of impossibility excludes financial inability. So the inability to pay your uh, vendor is not going to be um, permitted as a defense against, um, or allow you to use a defense of impossibility. Uh, and it excludes market events. Um, the courts will look at this on an objective basis, not a party subject basis. Uh, they will look to see from the standpoint of not just maybe the industry, but overall, whether it really is impossible for a party to perform. Um, Roy, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I think that last point is is worth emphasizing, and that is, it's not a subjective impossibility. I can't do this. I'm unable to do this. It's whether objectively the the courts would determine that it's not possible. 
Um, up above, we, we have, it says the event makes performance impossible or impracticable. There's been kind of a merging of those two. Maryland case law is definitely that impossibility is what's needed, not impracticability. Other jurisdictions, which we talked about earlier, may, may uh, use the term impracticability and have, have a lesser standard. Maryland is a fairly strict standard that it must be impossible. Okay, should we go to the next slide? Sure. Okay. Now, th this is the defense of frustration, and it differs from impossibility in that, that it must frustrate a party's principal purpose for entering into the contract. I think we might all remember from law school, there's a classic case of a renting of an apartment to view the Queen's coronation, and then the route of the coronation is uh, changed. It was not impossible to utilize the, the lease, but the, since the underlying assumption of the contract was that you would be able to view the coronation parade, the party's principal purpose was frustrated. And at least under English law, they were released from the contract. But again, these, these are basic assumptions of the contract and it cannot be the fault of the party asserting this defense it, that the event can, is, is being frustrated. So, and, and as we note, it must be a total frustration, not a partial frustration. There's, we've had the leading case here in Maryland. It happens to arise out of a domestic uh, situation, but it emphasizes the point that when the parties contract and they have the ability to contract for different uh, outcomes, that the failure to do so will not excuse uh, on a basis of frustration. There was a question which I noted that asked, whether if you have in your force majeure clause the failure or your inability to um, to pay for financial distress or other reasons, whether it would be worthwhile keeping that in your provision. Well, if you don't have it in your provision, it's certain that you're not going to be able to rely on that. But since force majeure provisions are contract provisions, which the courts look to see what you've listed, if you have listed that as a possible defense, then you may assert it. And so therefore it's probably very effective to keep that in your contract and not delete it, even though the courts do not say that such will be a defense that is improfitability or inability to pay. I think it's worth um, Roy, at least thinking about whether it makes a difference in your contract. So is there any if there is there any reason that you can think of where um in you know the inability to pay would be something that you would even consider happening so you know it's hard to think of a situation where payment cannot be made because of some impossibility uh so you know it's still a case by case analysis which we I think Roy would agree it's it's helpful to do in every single contract unlike what maybe many of us have been doing before covid-19 There was a question about the explosion of litigation on these clauses. Um, it's very likely and not very hard to predict that there, there's going to be uh, both in uh, commercial areas, leases that may have these clauses. There's bound to be a lot of people contemplating uh, such uh, litigation. It's also a concept which can be used for the negotiation or trying to resolve issues with uh, the other contracting party, which of course is always more beneficial than litigating, even spoken as a litigator. Um, so I, I, I think there is, but there, I think Sweda mentioned that because of the huge number of these cases, because of this pandemic, the courts may be taking a less stringent view of the some of these doctrines and some of these concepts than before because of the massive impact that this has had. So it, it is possible that there will be a loosening of these very strict concepts, um, which are absolute, uh, which appear absolute on their face because of the magnitude of the economic impact on uh, the country and businesses and individuals. I think one, um, one point to add to that is that we've been advising our clients to early on when they think there's going to be some sort of effect on their ability to perform to contact the counterparty. Uh, you know, most people are 
expecting to try and work things out. And generally, you know, in business contracts and business deals, that that does happen a lot of the time. But the parties can want to continue their relationship, even though there's been an inability to perform because of the impact of government orders and government regulations. So we encourage our clients to talk to the counterparties, see if they can themselves come up with a solution that will be acceptable to both parties uh, rather than waiting until the last minute and then realizing that, that, that this is going to blow up into litigation. Parties generally are going to want to be able, post-COVID, to be able to continue doing business and continue to be able to run their businesses and they need their vendors and suppliers to do so. So we definitely recommend that um, as the first step. Um, and I noticed there's a question uh, about the case that I've referred to, uh, uh, the Fourth Circuit case. Uh, there's a case in Maryland District Court also. I'd be happy to provide those uh, case citations to anyone who's interested in having them if they go through uh, the Bar Association or you tell me how to do that. I will provide those uh, case citations uh, for, uh, that you've asked about. Uh, and then there's one other, uh, there was a request to look at the materials from other jurisdictions. Um, I will send that to Andrea, and um, I don't know how she makes those things available, but I'm sure that uh, we can make that information available as well. Okay, I think we just go through the next two slides and we're completed. Next two slides, I think, are just our offices. <laughs> well, but you show where you are located, Lisa. Okay. So, um, so Alex, and we should be turning it over to you guys. Well, thank you, guys. I guess uh, Bill will be putting our slides up next. I hope everyone can hear me. I was having some connectivity issues. Um, there we go. Um, so uh, thank you guys uh, for, for handing it off to Alex and me. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, so moving on uh, through our slides, um, we uh, just in interest of full disclosure, Alex and I are insurance coverage lawyers, but our practice is exclusive for policyholders. Um, so we're going to go through today uh, the, the different types of claims that are likely to come up because of the COVID situation. And there will necessarily be a slant to, um, to what we present, I think, just because of the nature of our practice. And we just want it to be upfront about that. Um, and uh, I'm sure that there are some carrier side lawyers listening to to the webinar and, um, you know, please chime in if uh, if you think we say anything wrong or, or you take issue with anything, we'd uh, be interested to see your your questions and comments uh, when we get to the end. Um, so uh, moving on to our next slide, it, we're just um, this outlines what we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to start by talking about business interruption claims. That'll be the bulk of what we address. Um, those are, uh, you're seeing a lot about that in the news now, of course, in, in, in the legal blogs. Um, then we are also going to talk about and address event cancellation insurance coverage issues arising from the pandemic. And then just briefly, we'll talk about some other coverage issues that we're inevitably going to see. Um, for example, um, there, there have already been, and, and we expect there will continue to be, in addition to business interruption and event cancellation claims, bodily injury claims. Um, you know, I think there's uh, one has already, a, a DJ action was already filed with respect to a cruise ship alleging uh, bodily injury um, you know, negligence in exposing people to the virus, and then the policyholder is is seeking coverage for that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I think the the bulk of the time spent though will be on the business interruption and event cancellation. Um, and one preliminary remark, um, you know, we've seen there have already been many lawsuits filed, coverage lawsuits, um, and 
it's funny. We've um, we're handling a few, uh, nothing in active litigation yet, but we're handling a few claims. And I just wanted to say at the outset that this is it's not a cut and dry issue. Um, we've gotten a few inquiries from policyholders who are operating under we're operating under the assumption that uh, you know we're not going to have any kind of insurance coverage for our uh, you know business interruption losses or event cancellation losses or anything because things having to do with a pandemic we've been told just aren't covered by insurance and that just isn't the case. Um, it's going to be very fact specific. It's going to be very policy specific. Um, and there's a very wide variety of uh, potential claims out there that that could be covered under a standard uh, property policy, for instance. So, you know, I'm not really sure where the, this, you know, assumption is coming from, but we are seeing it quite a bit where people just think that there's not coverage. Um, you know, there's there are some legal blogs out there where, you know, policyholder lawyers are saying that that's a, you know, a tactic by insurance companies trying to plant that out there so that people don't make claims. I don't know if I buy that, um, but there is a presumption on, on a lot of people's part that they don't have coverage. And, and um, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it's definitely not the case. Um, we think that, uh, the, that and there may be limited coverage, you know, the, the losses that businesses are suffering because of the shutdown are huge and they may um, there may be no coverage. Um, but in a lot of instances, there may be some. Um, so just wanted to say that at, at the outset, I think everyone should um, really take a close look at at their policies, at their clients policies to, to determine whether or not there's coverage and, and not make any assumptions up front. So. Um, Moving on to our next slide, Alex is going to uh, just provide, and even the next slide, um, Bill, that one was a placeholder. Um, Alex, did you want to just go over the different types of business interruption that we're going to talk about, business interruption coverage? Sure. I think uh, Joe got us a little bit ahead, but it's fine. We can, we can stay on this instead of the placeholder slide. Um, but just some background on what uh, business interruption insurance is. Um, it's probably apparent to just about everybody on the call. That's that's why you're here today. Uh, but just in case, um, business interruption coverage is it's insurance that covers losses arising from a suspension in operations due to some form of property loss or damage. Um, it's a common add-on, as Joe mentioned, to commercial property insurance or sometimes commercial package policies. Um, but it can also just be a standalone policy in and of itself. Uh, it's typically comprised of two related coverages. Um, one is business income coverage, and that covers lost revenue during the suspension of your operations. Um, the other is extra expense coverage, um, and that's going to cover the costs that you incur to restore your damaged property uh, to working condition to get your business back up and running. Um, now, I mentioned, and, and this gets into these types of business interruption coverage that are on the screen now, that, you know, coverage arises from some type of property damage. But it's important to keep in mind that that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be damaged to your own property um, at your business. There are actually lots of different types of business interruption coverages, um, and coverage can be triggered not only by damage to your property, but also damage to other property. Um, so on this slide here, um, you know, we have a couple of examples. There's the classic business interruption, which is damage to your property that leads to an operational slowdown or shutdown. Um, there's also a contingent business interruption, which dovetails nicely with the force majeure portion of the presentation that um, Roy and Sueda gave, which is, you know, if damage to a customer or a supplier's property leads um, you to incur operational slowdown or shutdown losses, there can be coverage for that. Um, moving on to the next slide, we have a couple more examples. Um, leader coverage. This is really a form of contingent business interruption coverage, but we wanted to segregate it out because it doesn't really jump uh, front of mind for most people. But there can be coverage where um, you're a business that relies on a business near you. 
um, that, is, that is damaged and um, causes you to incur losses. So for example, you know, you're a hotel um, and the convention center nearby gets shut down. Um, then the big one that, you know, everyone's talking about right now, given the situation we're in, is, is civil authority coverage. And that applies when there's property damage within a certain radius that will be defined in your policy of your operations. And it causes the government to either limit or prohibit access to your business, which leads to more, you know, operational shutdown or, or slowdowns. So moving on to the next slide. Um, this is just an overview of some of the key coverage issues that, that can arise in um, business interruption claims and focused more on obviously what we're facing now with the pandemic. Um, these apply to all of those coverages that I, that I just discussed. Um, and we're going to walk through uh, some issues that crop up in each of these categories. Um, the first main issue is is there property damage? Um, because as I mentioned, that's sort of a prerequisite for all of these. And in many policies, that's sort of framed as, is there direct physical loss or damage? Um, then we're gonna talk about whether an exclusion might apply, one or more exclusions. Um, sometimes policies will have even exclusions specifically designed to um, address pandemics. Um, Third is an issue that's pretty unique to our situation right now. There's a lot of discussion about possible legislation uh, that could get passed that uh, changes the insurance landscape uh, pretty significantly. Um, it could change policy terms. It could affirm certain policy terms. It could shut up insurance funds. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, you know, if there is coverage, what is your loss and what are some specific issues that could uh, crop up in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic that will impact that loss calculation? Uh, so with that, I think we'll move into the property damage discussion and I'll hand it off to Joe. Yeah, so, so this issue in most business interruption coverage claims is going to be a threshold that the policyholder uh, needs to, to get over. In other words, and, and all policies are different. Um, the, these policies, there are standard form policies and you will see similarities in policies, but, um, the, the different types of, of coverage that Alex talked about or the different types of claims that can give rise to a business and a covered business interruption loss, um, can vary. So, but a lot of times the there is going to be a requirement, um, whether it's a straight business interruption claim or a contingent business interruption claim or a civil authority business interruption claim, there's going to be a requirement and language requiring some type of property damage or direct physical loss or damage. And I think that this this might be the source of why um, some policyholders are are operating under the assumption where I'm not going to have coverage for this. You know, I had a uh, a property policy and it covered my building, and you know, of course, if a storm came through and destroyed my building, uh, a hurricane or a, a fire, even well, that's what I got coverage for. And if that shuts my business down. I'll have my property loss for the building and then I'll have my business interruption loss because there was direct physical loss or damage. But then when you start talking about things like a pandemic, people might be assuming, well, that's not physical loss or damage. It's not property damage. So I don't have coverage, but that's um, it's definitely not the case. Um, and it's it's not a straightforward issue either way. There will be arguments on both sides, um, on the insurer side and the policyholder side. But um, there are, is a lot of analogous case law out there that would support the argument that uh, a contaminated property or a contaminated area that leads to a government shutdown of a business that under a property policy that would meet the direct physical loss or damage requirement. Um, and 
by the way, we didn't cite any cases on our slides, but we'd be glad anybody who wants to reach out to us directly, we'd be glad to share um, any any cases that we have. Um, and we have many um, that that might be of interest to your particular situation. So if you just email us or give us a call, we'd be glad to to provide you with any cases that that might be helpful to you. But there are cases out there, for example, um, where a a building that has asbestos in in the structure, in the walls, the building's fine. It's not falling down. You can go in it. You can use it. Uh, you can utilize it for your business. But courts have found that the 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 fact that asbestos is present in the structure meets the property damage slash direct physical loss or damage requirement to trigger property coverage. That certainly could be the case here where a, a business or like I said, an area is contaminated with a virus. Um, those arguments are going to have to be played out. Carriers will have case law to support arguments on their side in some jurisdictions, some jurisdictions, maybe not policyholders will will also have those arguments. Um, and there there will be authority to to support both sides. Um, and it's just going to have to play out. But um, I don't think either side um, at this point can say that that issue is a slam dunk. They they, they can't. Um, it's it's just going to have to play out in in the courts. Um, and they're going to be factual issues here that are important and in some cases determinative. Um, I think they're going to be expert issues. Um, you know, there, there might be instances where if a policyholder is in a situation where under their particular set of facts and their particular policy, they need to show that the virus was present in their business, say a bar, um, you know, was testing done on employees. And then if that testing was done on employees, you know, are there, is there going to be expert testimony that says, well, if the employee, if one employee had it, if two employees had it, if 10 employees had the virus, then certainly there was virus present on the, in the structure on the bar. Um, you know, so there are just a lot of issues there to be sorted out, but it's it's um, it, it's far from settled and, and both sides will have arguments to meet this um, or to to present on this initial threshold issue of whether or not there was direct physical loss such that you have a viable business interruption claim. So moving on from that threshold issue on our next slide we have some information about potential exclusions that uh, will undoubtedly come into play. Alex, did you want to talk about the viral exclusion? Sure, yeah, one of those exclusions um, is, is colloquially, colloquially referred to as the viral exclusion. Um, after the 2003 SARS outbreak, um, we saw insurers put exclusions directed at um, virus outbreaks into their policies with more frequency. Um, and by 2006, ISO actually published a, an endorsement um, directed at that. Its, its language is pretty simple uh, and straightforward. It just says, we will not pay for loss or damage caused by or resulting from any virus, bacterium, or other microorganism that induces or is capable of inducing physical distress, illness, or disease. Um, I guess I should say, it's simple. It's never straightforward. Um, but it's, um, you know, important to note that just because that form exists, it doesn't mean that every policy has that exclusion. Um, we've already seen plenty of lawsuits that have been filed um, where the exclusion isn't in place. Um, so it's just not an issue. And that's a really important fact for policyholders that don't have the exclusion. The fact that it exists um is evidence to support the argument that uh viral harm can be property damage um the why would insurers need to adopt the exclusion in the first place if um they there wasn't any concern that viral harm could be covered 
Um, so that's an important fact for any policyholder that has a policy that doesn't have this exclusion. It's good evidence to point to. Um, even if you do find yourself in a situation where you do have a viral exclusion, um, it's not necessarily a, a death knell for coverage by any means. Um, first, you know, many jurisdictions, just as a policy interpretation principle, narrowly construe exclusions against insurers. Um, so that is a favorable point. And, and taking advantage of that principle, we are already seeing creative coverage arguments um, in some of these early lawsuits that have been filed contrasting, for example, civil authority coverage and this exclusion. So on the one hand, under civil authority coverage, you, you get coverage for losses arising from government action. Um, on the other hand, you have a viral exclusion that excludes coverage for losses arising from a virus. So it, it's a narrow path, but there's a path to argue that, well, I didn't incur any loss due to a virus. I incurred a loss because the government prohibited access to my premises. And it happened to do so because there was property damage in the vicinity to another property. But the viral exclusion, which, you know, has this causation requirement is not triggered, but my coverage under the, the civil authority coverage is triggered. Um, so there are, uh, it's all going to be policy specific and you need to focus on your specific language, but there are opportunities to thread a needle, even if you do find yourself in a situation where you have a viral exclusion potentially. On the other hand, it's important to note, too, that some policies might have viral endorsements that actually affirmatively provide coverage in this situation. Um, uh, that also came out after the SARS epidemic. Oftentimes, those are subject to much lower limits than your standard um, policy coverage. So uh, you might actually find yourself in a situation where you need to argue that the endorsement doesn't apply for the same reasons that the exclusion doesn't apply which is the virus isn't the cause of the loss here. It is the civil authority um, shutdown. So a um, lot of important and policy specific and fact specific issues that crop up um, if you have exclusions. And it's by no means a situation where if you look at a policy and you have a viral exclusion that it means you don't have coverage. Um, another key exclusion that um, could come up in these discussions is the pollution exclusion. And Joe's going to talk a little bit about that. Sure. And um, most, who, a, a lot of people are familiar with the pollution exclusion, the absolute pollution exclusion or total pollution exclusion that you'll find in, in most insurance policies today. Um, and, you know, thinking about the pollution exclusion and how it evolved over time and and um, made its way into virtually every insurance policy. It's a, you know, it's a good example for the, this um, uh, to compare to the viral exclusion um, because we are seeing policies now that, you know, that viral exclusion has been out there. It's been available to insurers. Um, you know, there's a, a standard ISO endorsement that, that we cited here, um, but not everybody has incorporated it into their policies and not everybody is using it. So um, much like the pollution exclusion um, was back in, you know, say the, you know, 80s, mid 80s, um, we're going to find, I think, when we're looking at this issue, policies that um, some policies that have viral exclusions, but a lot that don't. Um, as you just have to look at the policy to 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 see what's what's there. Um, as for the pollution exclusion, um, I've you know I've come to feel relatively um, comfortable in the I don't know last five years or so when you have uh, the pollution exclusion uh, being raised for cases like this, in other words, cases that don't involve traditional environmental pollution, um, the pollution exclusion, um, it will certainly be raised. I think it's been raised in some denial letters that are cited in in a few of the, the declaratory judgment actions that have already been filed in connection with the pandemic. So insurers are and will likely continue to to 
raise it. Um, I'm not sure how far they'll go with it, but um, policyholders have gotten to a point where we're in a, a pretty good position to argue that it should not apply to situations like this. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, but there is certainly a, a great deal of good case law out there um, that that you know that says that the pollution exclusion should apply to traditional environmental pollution of the environment um, not a situation where you have for example carbon monoxide poisoning in a building there are cases that go both ways um, don't get me wrong but um, you know the I, I think that policy holders um, faced with that argument here are in, in pretty good shape to to argue that it should not exclude coverage for for losses arising from from the pandemic um so uh with that um those are the exclusions there will be other exclusions that that come up during all of this um but um those are the main ones i think um if you have that viral exclusion you're gonna have some trouble obviously pollution exclusion we don't think it should be as much of a problem um, but then moving on, you know, assuming, uh, you know, the, the um, I guess this is more of a, a problem and a concern for the carriers. It's a, a sort of a, a potential bonus for policyholders, um, you know, but assuming you, your policy might not cover you explicitly, there is legislation that a lot of people have probably heard about um in the works in various states and alex is going to talk a little bit about that sure we'll just touch on this briefly because all of this is very preliminary um certainly nothing has been passed yet um, but there have been discussions and even some proposed bills in some states um that uh could make some pretty significant changes in the insurance industry specific to uh this pandemic um there are some possible laws designed to you know clarify policies and shut down any argument that viral harm doesn't um constitute property damage um so just to affirm that coverage would apply in this instance there's even some discussions about reforming policies and just declaring you know viral exclusions or um any other exclusion that could apply null and void uh, either generally or in this context in particular um, there's the possibility that, you know, there could be government created insurance funds where um, insurers are contributing and the government is contributing in part. Um, and all of these have uh, involved discussions that that these could be applied retroactively. Um, so as long as you've made your claim um, that, that you would be. Uh, you would benefit from this legislation. Um, it's just something we need to keep an eye on and see how it develops. At this point, um, you know, as I mentioned, nothing's been passed. Even in the states that we've listed here, some of these states, it's just legislation being discussed at this point um, or that had been proposed and then uh, got pulled. Um, but um, there is legislation pending in at least some states, um, and we'll just have to see uh, where it goes from here. But it could be a very important development, it, it could really be determinative of coverage in many situations. But I think we can move on to the next slide. So Joe and Alex, let me ask you this. It sounds like this is much like the force majeure uh, analysis. That is, it's policy language specific, contract language specific, and fact specific. Is that right? Um, it's, it's absolutely right. Um, it just, um, it, it all depends the, you start with the policy and the facts and it's going to be all over the place. And that's why, you know, I said at the outset, um, you really have to just look at it on a case by case basis. Um, I think anyone, you should be suspect of anyone telling you, um, that there, there are, are broad conclusions that can be drawn about any of this it's it's very case specific um so the, the next topic and it's um it's a it's 
it's one of the most difficult with these claims for for policyholders and carriers, I think. Um, and that's calculating the loss. So if you have a a a, a case where you you have business interruption coverage, it's complicated to calculate your loss. Um, there again, you start with the policy and you have to see what it says. And there are a lot of different provisions out there in different policies that tell you how to calculate loss. Um, and a lot of different things can factor in. There can be there. There often almost always are going to be some type of temporal limitations. There could be a period up front where you have to be shut down before any coverage kicks in. And then there can be a limited period for which you have coverage. Um, I've seen a lot out there um, where um, uh, commentators are saying, you know, well, even if you have civil authority business interruption coverage, it's not that big of a deal because in a lot of cases, in most cases, it's going to be limited to something like four weeks. Um, I think that's a, a common period where you'll have, um, you know, civil authority business interruption coverage limited to. Um, and that might be the case, but I, I mean, I think that that could be very significant for many businesses. Um, I mean, you have a small business like a restaurant or a, a bar that shut down for, is it two months? Is it three months? Um, if you can get half or a third of that back, I think that's going to be very significant for mo for most businesses. So, but but those temporal limitations are there, and in calculating your loss, you have to to factor it in. Um, there's there there are provisions in business interruption coverage policies that um, talk about a restoration period. So once your property is restored and it's functional, um, you know, uh, then the coverage ends, you know, you're not going to have coverage for that moving forward and you have to factor in, um, you know, sometimes there will be extra expense though. So yes, the property was restored. In other words, in this case, it was cleaned of the virus. We had to decontaminate it. There's no more civil authority making us shut down, but maybe some things happen that, that make you uh, shut down for an extra week or so to get ramped back up to, to get your supplies. Um, and so these restoration period provisions could factor in. Um, and then, you know, there is this issue of, um, do you or do you not consider the market impact of the pandemic? So some of these policy provisions are written in a way where, and, and, um, people in the insurance coverage world will say that loss calculation for business interruption is much more an art than a science, um, because you will have both sides arguing about, um, you know, if you had been up and running, what was your loss? So, you know, um, you have carriers will, will say you have to factor in, and a lot of times policyholders can't disagree. Um, but if, if something happened out there in the world that, changed other things like the cost of goods that you need to uh operate well then a you know a carrier or a policyholder might argue you know we can't just look back at what i did um in april of 2019 and 2018 the April of 2020 is a different world and things like toilet paper or other things cost more. And so we might have to factor that into if you were up and running, you would have had more or less expenses for different things. Um, and all of that, again, it's policy specific and it's going to have to be um, worked out for these pandemic claims. But um, in the it's complicated and you have to the our advice to policyholders is always on the loss calculation get out in front um, because it's difficult and a lot of times getting out in front means having the right consultant or expert um, whether it's a forensic accountant um, or, or or some other type of of financial expert there, there are many of them out there who are very good at, at calculating 
um, what a loss actually is when a business is interrupted. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's, it's something that, that any policyholder who, who thinks they have a significant business interruption claim that is going to be covered, they should be thinking about the loss calculation very early, getting their house in order and, and getting the support that they need to, to calculate the loss. Um, so with that, we can move on to the next slide. So we're gonna, oh, sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, have at it, I was just <laughs> We're gonna transition to a different uh, type of coverage for a little bit here, um, which is event cancellation coverage, because we're seeing a lot of clients that um, have events that are affected, obviously, by the pandemic and um, have, in, have purchased insurance for that very purpose. Um, there is something out there, uh, colloquially referred to as event cancellation insurance. It applies to more than just cancellation, um, but it is there to cover losses arising from uh, impacts to events. Um, these are in contrast to uh, the property provisions we had just been discussing, um, pretty specialized coverages. These are typically standalone policies. And, you know, what we as we mentioned in the context of the business interruption, everything turns on policy language. That's particularly important in uh, the event cancellation context because these are not standardized policies in any way. They're all over the map. They're not always carefully worded. Um, so uh, that means that issues are often policy specific and subject to interpretation. Um, and so if we click on we'll see some of the key coverage issues we're gonna discuss here. Um, one is talk about some circumstances that might be covered by a, an event cancellation policy. Um, we're also gonna talk about some requirements that these policies might impose. Uh, we'll touch on exclusions here as well. And then just as uh, loss calculation is important in the business interruption context, it's very important in the event cancellation context as well. So moving on to some covered circumstances. Again, this is so policy specific, um, it's hard to, to speak about in the abstract, but um, some examples about you know, coverage that can apply under these policies, if you have to cancel an event, if you have to postpone it, if you have to relocate it, if, you have to, if, if your event gets curtailed in some way, um, even possibly if you had reduced attendance, if you put on the event, but nobody showed up because of the pandemic, obviously, um, that's probably these, these last few are going to come into play if you had events at the very, you know, early as the, as the pandemic was developing and at the beginning of the situation. Um, I think most of the claims are going to be, uh, cancellation or postponement claims, um, given where we are now with so many, uh, shutdown orders uh, across the country. Uh, and if we click on to the next slide. Um, some examples of um, requirements that you might see in these types of policies. I think Joe's going to talk about that a little bit. I think Joe's on mute right now, and then he's going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, just uh, very briefly on the um, the the requirements in these policies are all over the place. I would say that, you know, typically as a policyholder, if you have an event cancellation policy, you're going to be in, in really good shape um, in, in this, this, the, with, for the losses caused by the pandemic, assuming you don't have a viral exclusion, which you very well could. Um, but, you know, you're going to see things in these policies that um, talk about, you, you know, not being able to proceed with your event, um, you know, because there was uh, a legal inability to do so, um, like a civil order um, or a physical inability to proceed. Um, and that could mean different things. It could mean that a building was destroyed so you can't have the event. Um, it could mean um, that, you know, uh, uh, a, a road was was made inaccessible and people can't get there it can mean a lot of things. 
Um, and I, I don't see a lot of hurdles there for um, what we're dealing with with the pandemic because um, nobody can do anything. Um, you know, most of the country is on lockdown and um, there is an inability to have these events. But each policy handles it differently. And um, there there will be very specific language in these policies about, um, you know, the implications and requirements for coverage in the event of cancellation. And you have to compare that to those requirements for instances of postponement. And uh, policyholders and, and carriers need to look very carefully at these claims um, and policyholders in particular, when they're making their decisions, um, when they have been making their decisions, hopefully, and when they're making decisions in the coming weeks and months, about whether or not to postpone as opposed to just outright cancel, they should be looking at this coverage if they have it, in all likelihood they are, because there can be very, um, very different re different requirements um, for the two scenarios. Um, so moving on, um, just very quickly, the next slide, um, so, it, the exclusions that you're going to see in these policies are um, very much like the exclusions that we talked about before. Um, you know, there there could be a viral exclusion that is actually going, obviously, going to be very important um, and troublesome for for policyholders. There may be pollution exclusions. Um, there there could be a whole host of exclusions in these policies. And as Alex said, these policies more so than the property policies under which you're going to make your business interruption claims, these event cancellation policies are, we've seen them just all over the map. Um, we, and one thing with these that um, is, is interesting is, you know, you'll see someone who's had a policy, you know, say a business that just puts on, events all year long um, and they got a policy 10 15 years ago with a good carrier that they have a good relationship with and there's underwriting every year um, and they just keep the same policy and maybe you know the form gets changed a little bit here or there but it it's um, you know a policy that might have things in it that that don't make a lot of sense today because it's just been um, repeated over the years. Um, but there could be all kinds of exclusions and, um, you know, you're going to just encounter a lot of the issues that we talked about with the, with the business interruption claims. Um, and so moving on, um, Alex, did you want to talk about the, the loss cal calculation under the event cancellation policies? Sure. Um, just like in the business interruption context, um, calculating loss under event cancellation policies, it, it can be pretty complex. Um, and there are a lot of factual issues that could play into it, um, but it's also very dependent on the policy language. So one issue that we've seen crop up, um, and it's one you would expect, is you know, what do you do about refunds? Obviously, the, the first thing, if you're hosting an event, the first question you're going to be faced with, with from everybody who signed up and paid you ahead of time is, I want my money back because the event's not going forward. And um, there might be specific policy language addressing that. Um, and it might matter what form those refunds take. Are you simply returning the money? Are you giving a credit for a future event? Are you giving a coupon for some other product or service that you offer? Um, those decisions could potentially have coverage implications, or they might not. I mean, the policy may not distinguish between that, or they might treat them all similarly. We've seen plenty of examples of policies that do. Um, there's also you know, a question of what gave rise to the refund. Um, is it something you were contractually obligated to do? There might be a coverage distinction between that and um, just a refund that you voluntarily uh, provide a, as a gesture of goodwill or, you know, to, to save face sort of thing. Um, there also might not be distinguishing factors between that in the policy. Um, refunds can also give rise to some temporal questions. You know, for example, are you um, you know, if you do give a coupon or credit, is it for the same event or a different event? Is it for an event that's being held within the policy period or a later policy period? 
Um, how are you treating, if that's the case, how are you treating it from a tax perspective? Are you considering it on your books as revenue now or not revenue unless and until the, the coupon is, um, is used? Um, all of these are very fact specific. They're very policy specific. They may or may not matter depending on the policy language, but they're um, important considerations and they're things to think about um, as you uh, go about preparing your claim and making decisions um, in canceling and, and altering events because of the pandemic. Um, you know, the other issue that crops up in the loss calculation context is mitigation. Um, like uh, typical uh, policies, event cancellation policies have um, imposed duties on policyholders to mitigate losses where they can. Um, they need to cooperate with carrier with the carriers um, when asked. Uh, there could be um, specific obligations to uh, try to reschedule or relocate where possible as opposed to simply canceling. There could be duties to seek refunds or credits for your own expenses to offset the refunds that you're giving um, to others. Again, all very policy specific issues, um, but uh, those are just various considerations that come up in the loss calculation context for event cancellation policies. Um, so moving on, I think the last topic we were going to briefly touch on is just other insurance issues that crop up. I mean, the two big ones we have been seeing are business interruption issues and event cancellation claims. Um, but there are other issues that, that can come up, as Joe mentioned at the outset. I think he's going to elaborate on that a little bit more now. Yeah. And we already talked about the bodily injury claims. I think um, we can just wrap up by maybe saying something about uh, bad faith. Um, that's always a topic that, um, you know, uh, policyholders and uh, maybe lawyers handling claims for policyholders. Um, throw out there it can have a lot of implications and um you know we didn't talk a lot about it because i think it's just um you know you talk about case by case i mean you know to um whether or not there's bad faith in these claims um is you know it depends on how the insurer handled the claim and the only reason i even bring it up is because i know in some of the lawsuits that have already been filed and it seems like there are a couple filed every day um and they've been filed in many jurisdictions now across the country, DJ actions for coverage. I know in some of them, there have been claims of bad faith. Um, and, you know, it's too early to tell. I think the, you know, how, how much of an issue that is going to be with these pandemic claims. I think the, the policyholders who, who have included those in claims so far probably did so because, the insurance company made a very quick sweeping decision that there was no coverage. Um, so the, the policyholder in those cases probably felt that that warranted a bad faith claim. I would just say that that's something that's going to play out. Um, we know that the insurance industry, um, it, you know, th there were policyholder lawyers. So like I said, there's always a slant for us to, to favor the, the policyholder perspective, but, the insurance industry, like all other industries, is is dealing with this. There, um, some of them are going to deal with it well. Some of them won't deal with it so well. Um, and and bad faith. I know it's always an interesting topic when you're talking about coverage claims. Um, and and there'll be those discussions. It's just sort of a an issue that we're gonna have to see how it plays out. Um, I think that was our last slide. We did have. Um, we had a, one question we could could try to address quickly. Um, we had a, a the question posed that if if a a a property was damaged due to virus contamination, wouldn't you inspect the insurer to just step in, either help decontaminate the property or or otherwise eliminate the the property damage or direct direct physical loss so that it would, um, you know, reduce the loss to, 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 to minimize it. Um, and, you know, uh, I guess the way I would answer that is sure. 
um, the insurer could do that. And it may or may not have an effect on the extent of the loss. Um, if you have a policy that, um, you know, says that the, the loss calculation or the period of loss cuts off as soon as the property is restored, um, then maybe that would end the loss on the day that it was decontaminated if that, de if that contamination is what constitutes the property damage. Um, if you have a policy where the, the physical loss is just that sort of prerequisite and if it happens and then you're shut down, for, you know, because of something like a civil order, then the mitigation wouldn't matter so much because you're still out of business and still, um, it's still, uh, you know, your loss is still accumulating. Um, so and I, I would just add that, um, you know, it, it ties into what Joe mentioned earlier about how important experts may be to this. Um, I think that that's a factual question as to what, actually constitutes decontamination what's successful i think there could be lots of factual issues about whether somebody is actually tested positive in your property whether employees whether it's spreading among employees whether their risk of recontamination just by virtue of being open and then like joe said if it's a civil authority issue even if you clean it up but you can't open back up for many weeks um that's obviously a factor and and you know, to take into consideration. Yep. So that's all we had. And just like to say thank you for everyone who, who listened in and, and thanks very much for the MSBA for asking us to do this and Andrea and everyone there. Thanks for everything you're doing to, to put these on during this time. I know we really appreciate it. Can I jump back in? There's been some questions that we could uh, yep. address. Uh, there was a question whether if the event is not a permanent event, but it is only a temporary event, whether doctrines like impossibility or frustration would be a suspension of performance or a discharge of performance. Well, again, I think it's just depend on the facts. It depends if there is a permanent event that prevents performance that would be an absolute discharge. In the if it's a if it's like COVID nineteen, where it may or may not end after a certain period of time, the performance may be suspended. But then the factors become if it's suspended for such a lengthy period of time that it becomes under either the UCC or another doctrine, it becomes impractical to be able to perform. Then there might also operate as an absolute discharge if it's a temporary event, maybe several months, then perhaps your performance would be suspended rather than your performance being totally discharged under either of the doctrines of impossibility or frustration. Of course, frustration means that you can't achieve the basic assumption of your contract. And so that's why it differs from impossibility. Impossibility, impossibility is a determination of foreseeability of an event. Frustration means that it is an unforeseen event, but you cannot achieve the objective of your contract, which may be different from impossibility. Okay. Um, if we don't have any further questions, um, I want to take a moment and thank our panel, uh, Joe Beavers and Alex Kretikos with Miles and Stockbridge and Sweda Gandhi and Roy, uh, Sweda is with Sal Ewing and Roy Niedermeyer from Paley Rothman. I really appreciate all our presenters uh, time and effort that they put into uh, our seminar today. It's been uh, topics that have been requested from our membership and uh, I think um, based on the questions that we've gotten and the you know 230 uh, viewers that have joined us uh, today uh, obviously uh, topics of, of great interest and concern so thank you to our presenters and thank you very much to the MSBA business law section for supporting this uh, this presentation uh, we will be sending out a survey uh, asking for your feedback 
and uh, thank you to my team here on the MSBA uh, side for your efforts in supporting and uh, presenting this seminar today. Uh, I would encourage anybody who is uh, participating and uh, as a viewer or faculty member to send us suggestions at uh, Chriselle at msba.org. Uh, if you are, if there are other topics that, that you want to hear about, uh, please let us know and we will keep working with our sections to uh, provide this content for you during this very difficult time. So with that, we will close today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, and take care. Thank you and stay well.